satisfactory to the person who asked the question. Um, uh, it's a nice couple. Uh, again, I never mention names of who it is that asked the questions because uh, nobody's given permission for that. And uh, they do allow me to give the answer via this medium uh, because I've explained many times before. I think it's helpful because you're able to get the feedback of other devotees and especially more senior devotees, <clears throat> excuse me, more senior devotees, and that can only help in answering the question and, and being more thorough in presenting uh, the answer. So this particular question, and again, I'm paraphrasing the question because a lot of times when people send a question, they send it and it's couched as a question, but usually in a very long, long sort of expose and then they'll ask the question in, in the context of that. So I try to just, you know, extract the question from the fullness of the writing and, and deal with that. So essentially the question dealt around a verse uh, which was paraphrased in the writing that the it was a couple actually uh, sent. And it was the question that, how do we view uh, sex life in Krishna consciousness, especially in light of this verse, which is directly uh, according to what they're quoting here, uh, they paraphrased it rather, but spoken by Krishna, that I am sex life. Of course, the quote was very, <laughs> uh, very incomplete <laughs> because the actual verse is from the seventh chapter of Bhagavad Gita, I think it's verse 11 here. Balavam, uh, balam, balavantam chaham, kamo raga vivajitam, dharma virudeshu, uh, dharma viruda bhuteshu, kamo shmi vartashaba. So this is the verse. And so it, it's clearly not <laughs> just like a one line thing, I am sex life. Uh, but it, it, it's a whole explanation of something. And there, as I mentioned uh, at other times, I don't know if I've ever mentioned in the question and answer sessions, but certainly in the course of doing Harikata, that there are many levels to understanding Bhagavad Gita and any Sastra. Just like in Srimad Bhagavatam, it's mentioned, Tulya Bhagavata Krishna Vibhu Savasrai Prati Shloke Prati Akshare Nana Arutakai. It means not only every verse, but even every letter of Srimad Bhagavatam may have Nana Arutakai, means it may have so many different meanings. Similarly, Bhagavad Gita can be seen in that same way. It can have very different meanings according to what level you are speaking uh, Bhagavad Gita on. So here, I think, obviously, it's apropos that we're talking about the Samanya Nupakyan, means the general instructions to be gleaned from this verse in Bhagavad Gita, right? Because we're not talking about more esoteric things in the meaning of this verse, but what is meant in the general sense uh, by this verse. So first, Krishna is describing the nature of his opulences. And he describes that balam balavantam chaham. I am the strength in the strong. So strength can be looked at in many ways. Physical strength, mental strength, uh, the ability to practice spiritual life, which requires a transcendental type of strength that we know we derive from a Kanda Guru Tattva, who Sri Baladevji, right? The very word Bhala means strength. And Ram, Balaram, means Ramayate Iti Rama. So the ability by spiritual strength to give pleasure to Krishna 
is the genesis of the name of our Balaram Ji. <laughs> Sri Balaram Ji means that person who, because he is the controlling or predominating deity of the Sandini Shakti, the substance of serving principle to Krishna, and Seva Vritti, the attitude of serving Krishna, Baladev is the presiding deity of that, and because the Haladini Shakti, the pleasure potency, is imbued in Sandini, they, they work together, right, so that the potency that gives Krishna happiness and the substance that Krishna tastes that happiness through work in concert, right? So, here Krishna is saying that he is the strength of the strong, so on so many levels, in the mundane realm, uh, in terms of physical strength, intellectual strength, uh, the, the ability to tolerate, right? It requires a certain kind of strength to be able to tolerate things. Like in this verse, right? It requires a certain strength to look at things from that perspective, right? So all kinds of strength originates in Sri Krishna. So he says, Cha Aham, I am the source of this strength. There's another important understanding of Krishna using the word aham because it's used in many places in Bhagavad Gita. Aham sabhasha prabhavo. So many verses will use aham. Right? Aham is the indication of being swarat. Swarat means independent. It means you are not dependent on another source for, for the karana and karata of whatever you do. Karna means the cause and karta means the implementation of something. When you are independent, then you have the ability to both desire and carry out your desires without the agency of something else. For the jiva, that's not possible. Because the jiva is like everything else in the material world and even in the spiritual world, is dependent on Krishna. Right? Krishna himself is described in the first, first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam as Abhigyaswarat. So here Swarat means so many things. It means he's Akila Samjita Murti. He is the repository of tasting so many kinds of happiness and pleasure. And he's also independent in his ability to execute the fulfillment of his own desires. So Krishna uses the word aham properly. But when the jiva, whose true nomenclature is dasosmi, Right? Das Asmi. Asmi means I am. And Das essentially means my constitutional reality is that I am a servant of Krishna. That Dasatva has some Vaishishta means, some speciality, when there's the influence of Swarup Shakti and we realize, oh, I am the Das of Krishna in a particular type of way. But constitutionally, we are all Das of Krishna. Knowingly or unknowingly. Everyone is the Das of Krishna. So the nomenclature, Aham, is really not applicable to the jiva, right? And therefore, when you add ahamkara, right? Because I think I've explained this many times before, but just in brief, the first feature of avidya ignorance is asmi, or asmita, right? So asmi ita means a condition of considering yourself to be something other than the servant of Krishna. In order for that abhiman or self-conception to work properly, it requires some other agency. So that other agency is provided by Sankarshan Tattva, right? Which attracts your abhiman of being something other than the servant of Krishna to the material energy and creating a vicarious relationship between the two gives rise to what is called ahamkara. I am the doer and cause of my activities. So I've explained before, of course, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna has shut that idea down because prakriti kriya monani gunai kamani savasha aham kara vimunatma kartam iti manyate. It is a state of bewilderment to think that the jiva is aham, doer and cause of their own activities because actually everything is being carried out by the modes of material nature, right? So. The aham nomenclature is applicable to Bhagavan and dasosmi is applicable to the jiva. Now then Krishna says, kam rab vivarjita. Devoid of kam and rab. So rab means attachment. This is the context being used here. And kam means 
uh, material desire, not only sex life. Sex life just is the prominent undercurrent that runs through all desires in the material world is sex energy, but it doesn't strictly mean sex energy. Desire to enjoy oneself in any way. Atma Indriya Prati, Hataravanche Bhale Kam. Chaitanya Chaitamrita has given this explanation. The desire to enjoy oneself in any way, form or fashion, is called calm. Calm naturally has a relationship with attachment because whenever you want to do something for your self-enjoyment, you become attached to that idea. And it's the basis of that attachment that allows a person to go to extreme measures to fulfill that desire of enjoyment that they have. Of course, this is encapsulated nicely in the story of Sri, not Sri, but Bivol Mongol Thakur. And yes, Sri Bivol Mongol Thakur because, of course, he becomes great devotee. If anybody will read uh, Krishna Karnamrita, you can see how he's become so elevated class of devotee. But the beginning of the story of Bivol Mongol Thakur shows what is the nature and function when calm becomes extreme. In order to go and have association with the prostitute Chintamani, he went through extreme measures of going through a storm, crossing a river on a dead body, of breaching the wall of Chintamani's house by latching onto a poisonous serpent, right? And through all of those things, he was willing to endure in order to obtain the fulfillment of his calm, his desire, right? So, but here it says, Kamra Vivajita. Void of that kind of mood, without that kind of mood, of attachment and extreme self-interest, right? Then Krishna says, Dhamma Virudeshu Bhartasham, oh, excuse me, Dhamma Virudo Bhuteshu, right? Kamo Asmi Bhartashaba. I am that kind of calm, that kind of hmm, interest, which is Dharma avirud, so which is not contradictory to Dharma. Dharma virud would mean contradictory, but Dharma avirud means which is not contradictory to Dharma. And what is the ultimate Dharma? Savayakum sam paro dharmo yato bhakti rotsaji. Pure bhakti or mm, parma bhakti, this is ultimate Dharma. <laughs> so Krishna is saying here, he is that calm which is not against the principle of dharma. Even if you say, not looking at it from the angle of pure bhakti, right? But looking only from the angle of lokik dharma. Lokik dharma means worldly dharma. Then Krishna is saying, I am that sex life which follows the principles of dharma. What are the principles of dharma as far as sex life is concerned? Well, here, dharmic principles for sex life is that one first should be married. Secondly, the purpose of the execution of calm or sensual uh, activity is for the procreation of souls. So, essentially, the husband and wife are a facility to manifest the karmic unfoldment of jivas. And according to the elevation of the parents, they naturally attract jivas at a level of unfoldment which are suitable to the environment that they are manifesting. So let me try to repeat that. I don't know if I said it properly. Let's say the parents are devotees and they're manifesting a nice devotional atmosphere. Then, by their sensual engagement, they can attract a jiva whose karmic portfolio is suited to now uh, developing more in bhakti and they'll attract that kind of soul uh, to their family. Similarly, if someone has a very tamasic life, a very dark life, and they engage in, in sexual endeavor, then they are invoking and attracting souls which would be right for their karmic portfolios in that environment. So it's, you know, obviously a very important thing uh, to understand the whole idea of how uh, the 
nature of our central engagement. What is the purpose of it for one? What's the responsibility inherent in it? Because it says one should not become a parent unless one is fit to become a parent. Like one should not be guru, one should not be king, one should also not be parent. Because the parent is the first guru of the child. So it's a great responsibility. Now, obviously, the basis of dharmic execution of sensual activity, husband and wife, is one that has to be marriage. Because marriage is a dharmic shelter. It is a dharmic asraya for the principle of the association of men and women. Right? It's called the grihasta asrama. Right? Grihasta being situated in your griha, but you've taken shelter of spiritual life, therefore it has become an ashram. It is a place where though husband and wife are living with children in a griha or house, the environment is like an ashram. So grihasta ashram. Right? On the other hand, griha maybe means living in such a way that there is no ashram environment. And therefore, the entire existence of the graha is based around the satisfaction of individual desires. Right? So, also, when it comes to various kinds of uh, understanding of the sexual energy, it's also important to understand because now, and it is not a new phenomenon, but now we speak more openly and more consistently of considerations of those whose sexual orientation is not even uh, geared as male and female, their sexual orientation. I'm not talking about their chromosomal arrangement. I'm talking about their orientation. And the sexual orientation a person has is part of their karmic portfolio, right? Because according to your mindset and your activities, everything else, that carries from one life to another. So it is a fact that there is part of the karmic portfolio of someone in general uh, a tendency to have attraction one way or another, right? Point being that whether it is heterosexuality, uh, transsexuality of any sort, right? Uh, then the consideration still applies. How is my sexuality related to Dharma and service to Bhagavan? Now, you cannot say that heterosexuality, oh, this will be okay because, you know, it's man and woman and therefore uh, no matter how uh, frequently we have sexual activity, everything, oh, that's fine because it's heterosexuality. No. All sexuality has to come under the guise of dharma. The only dharmic ability is what would be there to facilitate the procreation of children. That's very clear. The purport here, Srila Prabhupada has written, similarly, sex life according to religious principles, dharma, should be for the propagation of children, not otherwise. So that's a very clear, unambiguous statement. And we can't change that. So then what happens if your sexual inclinations are different? Then it means you, if you want to truly practice bhakti, truly unfold in dharma period, You'll have to curtail, not curtail, uh, 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 I don't want to use the word because you don't get rid of, but you have to, you have to find a way to, to see the superiority of your dharmic life. And then if it's in bhakti, especially your unfoldment is bhakti as the sacrifice of those things which are pratikul to bhakti. Pratikul means not favorable. So overindulgent heterosexuality is pratikul to bhakti. Any alternative sexuality, because it cannot facilitate the dharmic principle, will be pratikul to bhakti. Not the person. The engagement. So also be clear on that. Because bhakti does not mm, say, oh, if this was your prior inclination, right, then you are not eligible for bhakti. Everyone is eligible for bhakti because everyone constitutionally is das of Krishna. You understand? So there is no restriction in terms of eligibility to practice bhakti. 
But according to your comic portfolio, you have to examine that comic portfolio and see in doing sarnagati, anukuyasha sankapa pratikuyasha vivarjanam. Here that word vivarjit, avivarjatam is mentioned again. Whatever is pratiku has to be given up. And what is anuku, that should be accepted. Anukuyasha sankalpa pratikuyasha vivarjanam. So I can take a sankalp, I can take a vow to do those things that are favorable. But what is unfavorable, that has to be given up. So whether it's overindulgent heterosexuality or whether it's alternative sexuality, which has no facility of seva in the matter of producing a venue for souls into the world, then both of those have to be considered, uh, the two things, overindulgent heterosexuality, or not according to religious principles, or alternative sexuality, as pratikul to bhakti. The person is not pratikul. The activity is pratikul. You understand? Eating is not pratikul to bhakti. Eating flesh and forbidden foods is pratikul to bhakti. You understand? So we have to be able to understand and to uh, see without personal bias the difference between what is favorable and what is unfavorable for bhakti. Right? So I'm hoping this was a sufficient answer uh, to the question regarding that Krishna, he is not sex life. <laughs> Krishna is saying here clearly, Kamo Dharma Virudeshu Dharma Viruda Bhuteshu Kamo Smibata Shabha. Right? That I am that calm which is not contrary to religious principles, and the Samanyan Upakyan, or the base meaning of that, is that Krishna is the power, because Krishna is the procreative energy also. One Shakti of Krishna is the procreative energy. Right? So everything has come from Bhagavan. On a more esoteric level, this verse has other kinds of meanings. I don't think it's appropriate here to go into that. But I, I think the Samanyan, the general meaning here, is what should be focused on. So, again, I'm praying that this was a short answer, but an answer to the question of the very nice couple who asked the question. And if there is any follow-up question, you can certainly, again, write. Uh, and again, as always, I always invite devotees to comment if they would like to add something uh, or to get clarification on something or to elucidate something um, regarding whatever was asked and answered. So my dandavat pranam, I'll have to go ahead and continue with uh, our service and also for those whose ikadasi brat falls today, then Madhava titi ikadasi ki jai, those of course who according to the titi, the ikadasi was yesterday for them because it was suitable for fasting um, then uh, also for your pardon <laughs> and your observance of the Ikadasi Brat. Jai. Pancha Kalpatulu Vishcha Kripashin Vayavacha Patitanam Pavnivu Vaishnavi Vyo Namo Namaha Jai Radhe Radhe.